second scripture lesson tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. As it is told to us from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Listen now for God's word to you. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Though the grass may wither and the flowers may fade, the word of our Lord endures forever. In my household with two small children, we talk a lot about being a helper. We're learning to help clean up, help put on our shoes, help be kind to our sibling, give to others, and to listen. We're still working on it, but aren't we all? So when my daughter asked me this week to tell her this week's big Bible story, I was eager to share in her excitement about the Bible and also to give another good lesson about being a good helper. I told her the story about the Good Samaritan and ended with the moral of the story. Jesus tells us to be good helpers. And so I asked her, how can you be a good helper? She thought about it for a minute and then said, well, I'm not going to change my brother's diapers. <laughs> Clearly, I told the story wrong. <laughs> but before I could counter her decidedly unhelpful response, she rethought it, and she said, wait, I could be a helper. I can't change his diaper, but maybe I can get you the diaper and the wipe and the changing mat. I said, that's what a helper does. You can figure out how you can be helpful, even if you can't do it all. She said, okay, next time I'll get the diaper, but you still have to change it. <laughs> this helping thing is always a work in progress. I love how much truth comes from our youngest disciples. Because when we first approach the story and the parable of the Good Samaritan, we think we know it, right? 
This is the easiest of the big Bible stories. We're supposed to be good helpers. We're supposed to help people in need. We got this one. The end. But even a four-year-old knows that helping is so much more complex than that. A four-year-old who wants to be helpful cannot help in all situations. A 40-year-old who wants to be helpful cannot be helpful in all situations. Trust me, no good can come from asking me to build something, but if you want biblically sound advice, I'm your gal. We understand a scenario like this, right, where we find ourselves to be helpful in some situations and not helpful in others. And the original hearers of the Good Samaritan would have similarly understood the type of scenario that was presented in this parable, where some of the characters are considered to be good helpers and some are not. Yet by the end of the parable, Jesus will challenge that very notion. And this big story begins with a big question. A lawyer stands up to test Jesus with two questions. He asks, one, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And two, who is my neighbor? Now, wouldn't it be nice if Jesus just gave a straightforward answer? Do this, and you can go to heaven. This is your list of people who are your neighbors. Help them. You got this, the end. But Jesus, in true Jesus fashion, doesn't do that. Instead, Jesus tells us a story. He presents a scenario where we need to figure it out ourselves. Jesus presents a complex story with a complex solution. And he tells a story where we must decide who is the neighbor? Who is the helper? Who am I in this story? Jesus tells us about a man who walks along a dangerous and treacherous road. He's walking along, minding his own business when he's mugged. The robbers take his clothes and beat him up and leave him for dead by the side of the road. Now, this guy is in need of immediate help, but like I told the children, he doesn't have a cell phone. He can't dial 911. He must wait for help to happen upon him. And it so happens that he's in luck because someone does come along. A priest comes walking down the road. The priest is the perfect helper, a servant of God. The priest sees the wounded man, but instead of helping... He crosses to the other side of the road and moves along his merry way. Now, maybe he had his reasons. As a priest, he might be worried about losing his job because touching blood or the dead would preclude him from temple rites. Maybe he's concerned with religious purity. Maybe he doesn't like getting his hands dirty. Maybe he thought it wasn't his job to help. Maybe he's just a jerk. <laughs> Jesus doesn't say. What we know is this. He makes a decision not to help. Next, a Levite. A judge comes by. Another authority figure. Another person who represents God and the common good. Another person who represents law and love. Another person expected to be that big helper. But he makes the same exact decision. He also sees the man in pain, and he crosses to the other side of the road and moves along his merry way. Maybe he had his reasons too. Maybe he was a little scared of blood. Maybe he was worried about getting mugged himself. Maybe he was in a rush to get to court. Maybe he, too, is just a jerk. Jesus doesn't say. What we know is this. He made a decision not to help. And then third, after the supposed helpers, the representatives of God and government pass by, the anti-hero arrives on the scene. A Samaritan sees the wounded man. Now, when we hear the word Samaritan, we immediately think 
of someone who helps, right? We have Samaritan hospitals, hospices, Samaritan thrift stores and counseling centers, Samaritan humanitarian aid organizations. We hear helper when we hear Samaritan. But when Jesus' first century audience heard the word Samaritan, they think bad guy. The Samaritans were a people rejected and despised by Jesus' audience of Israelites. Just a chapter before in Luke 9, Jesus and his followers are rejected by a Samaritan village, and that's when Jesus tells them to shake the dust from their sandals and move on. In John 9, when, I'm sorry, in John 4, when Jesus encounters the Samaritan woman at the well, John tells us that Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. All that to say, Samaritans, the Samaritan, should have been the guy who passed by on the other side. But he's not. Because Jesus turns all expectations on their head. It's the Samaritan and not the priest or the Levite who is moved to pity. It's the Samaritan who provides medical care and transport to an inn. It's the Samaritan who funds the man's care and recovery. Why? Jesus tells us he was simply moved to pity and filled with mercy. And so what we know is this. The Samaritan makes a decision to help. So Jesus concludes the parable with a question. Who is the neighbor? Who is the helper? The lawyer, stunned, doesn't say the Samaritan. Instead, he answers, the one who shows him mercy The neighbor is anyone who makes a decision to help, which means that mercy and help can come from anyone. Mercy and help can come from anywhere. Mercy and help can come from you. So will it? Will you be a person of mercy? Will you be a helper? Will you get down in that ditch and help? Or will you pass by on the other side? Will you accept help? Will you allow help to come from unexpected places? It seems so easy. We want to say yes, of course, right? But we know it's so much more complex than that especially these days when it feels it's so easy to feel helpless. Every day we're bombarded by news and news feeds of so many people and places and circumstances that need help desperately. The world is on fire, literally and figuratively. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel helpless in the face of it all. I want to end the pandemic and to put out wildfires and stop the shootings and end racism and feed the hungry and heal the sick and wipe the eye, the tears from the eyes and on and on. But I'm just one person. How can I make a big difference? That's why Jesus tells us two very important things in this big story to help us focus in on times like these. The first is that help comes from unexpected places when God arrives on the scene. And two, we are to help what is right in front of us. I read an article recently by pastor and theologian Nadia Boltz Weber, where she talked about her feeling of being so overwhelmed by the world's problems. She writes, I don't think our psyches were developed to hold, feel, and respond to everything coming at them right now. Every tragedy, injustice, sorrow, and natural disaster happening to every human across the entire planet in real time, every minute of the day. She writes, the human heart and spirit were developed to be able to hold, feel, and respond to any tragedy, sorrow, or natural disaster that is happening 
in our village. And she capitalized, in our village. She says here what Jesus says in the parable of the Good Samaritan, help what is right in front of you. Both Weber suggests that we add, add a few important questions when we are trying to determine how to help. She said we should ask ourselves, what is mine to do and what is not mine to do? What is mine to say and what is not mine to say? She says the third one is harder. What is mine to care about and what is not mine to care about? Meaning that some of us are, of course, called to do international missions. And some of us are called to do local missions. Some of us are called to be builders and some Bible thumpers. But all of us, yes, all of us are called to help the person right in front of us. We may not be able to heal a wounded person on the streets, but we could call for help to get someone who can. We may not be able to afford to pay for his care and recovery, but we could find a person or an organization who can. Jesus says that we can't always help everyone everywhere, but we can and we must make the decision to help the person right in front of us. Which means if someone is struggling in your own home, help. If someone is grieving in your church, help. If someone is hungry in your town, help. If someone is oppressed in your community, help. If someone is your neighbor, show grace and mercy. If someone is your neighbor, allow their grace and mercy to come and help you. And so we too have a decision. What is yours to do? Or as Jesus says, go and do likewise. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. God, we lift our lives and our homes and our church and our community up before you. And we ask for the strength and the courage to be good helpers. God, help us to know how to help. Help us to know what is ours to do, for you have given us each gifts so that we might serve your community and your people. Help us, as Jesus has instructed us, to go and do likewise, like the Good Samaritan. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.